Welcome everybody to another deep dive into chess history here on the Gotham Chess YouTube channel. Today we are taking a look at the American player Frank Marshall. He was the US champion for over 20 years, and I believe over that same 20 year span in the early 20th century, he didn't finish anywhere below top six in any international tournament. So, a very creative and imaginative player who frequently liked to partake in the intake of certain liquid substances during his games and just basically generally have a good time. Today we are looking at his game, number one, against Levitsky, uh, and this one is known as the Gold Coins game, because at the end of it, apparently the move was so gangster that they showered gold coins on the chessboard. Then I will show you another part uh, of his genius, but I will save you that for part two, but timestamps on the video player, let's go. We have d4, e6, e4, d5, what's known as a transposition to a French defense. You'll notice that the game actually does not begin with e4, which is normally how the French defense gets played. Uh, d4, e6 is kind of an invitation for white to go back to the French. Black play, uh, white plays knight to c3. This is known as the classical French. Maybe back then it was known as the I'm developing a knight to the center of the board French, defending my pawn. And black plays c5. Now it's pretty interesting because nowadays c5 is, is known as a suboptimal move because here there is just a very quick kind of refutation of this setup where white can play e takes d5, takes and even take again. And basically the problem is that you've just given yourself this weakness when all the dust settles. Now, I'm sure Mr. Marshall didn't just, you know, he wasn't just gonna lose this pawn. Maybe he was gonna play d4 and attack the knight. Maybe he was gonna play knight f6 and kind of wait to recapture the pawn on c5. But uh, it's pretty well known you cannot play c5 against knight c3, but you can play c5 against knight d2. Knight d2 in the French is known as the Tarash variation or Tarash variation. Here you can play c5 because the queen no longer, you know, occupies that that center, uh, that center file. So c5, knight f3, knight c6, we have one trade. And again, dc5 here may be possible, but white just develops calmly, bishop e2, knight f6, white castles, bishop e7, bishop g5, and short castle. So both players have now more or less completed the kind of necessary uh, developing moves. They've, they've gotten their knights out. They Black still has to get the light sword bishop out, but both kings are castle. Now at this point, again, for white, you need to play this in a more positional way. You basically need to take on c5 and need to, you need to maximize your pressure on this now isolated pawn. This would be a position if white played d takes c5, uh, well, rather white did play d takes c5, tr making it a position where black has an isolated pawn. Now, when there is an isolated pawn, the drawback of it is that it's weak in all end games. So actually the guy playing against it, in this case Levitsky, wants to make trades to then remove the defenders of that pawn, whereas Frank Marshall wants to make this pawn very strong. He wants to reinforce it, make the right trades in the position to reinforce that pawn. And oftentimes you can move around an isolated pawn easier. Does that make sense? Because you have more open lines and files because you've traded off its neighboring pawns. So there's a little strategy lesson for you. Uh, here he plays bishop e6, not recapturing yet because he needs to reinforce this first. And white plays knight d4, trying to take advantage of the, you know, he, think about that. He just took, now he transfers the knight, right? To the open square. Now, here, again, this is a situation where you, you got to think about the future. If you snap take here, then white develops the queen and now guards this. You know, if you go to try to win this pawn back, maybe white's just going to go b4. And all of a sudden, you're like running out of moves. You're, you're not going to be able to attack that pawn enough. Maybe you're going to have to play b6 and create chaos on this side of the board. So for that reason, you shouldn't snap take things. You have to evaluate what trades are good and bad. And now, now we get knight c4, we get bishop c5, inviting the knight to take the bishop. Now, normally, giving up a knight for a bishop without a good reason is, is not recommended. In this case, there are multiple good reasons to make this trade. Number one, you're no longer isolated. In fact, your pawns are together, which is what I just said. Right? I know what I'm doing, you know, I'm prefacing with the, and then, you know, intertwining the current position. Listen, it's part of the job, but something else happens. Very small change. But for my beginners and my intermediate players, listen up. You got to evaluate what else changes in the position. First of all, this pawn moved, which means this rook is open if the knight moves in the future. Right? See? And this is open. So maybe the queen can transfer out this way. That is how the board changes when trades happen. But white also sees how the board changes when trades happen. White immediately goes for that weakness. And you can't just take that because you lose your queen. Losing a queen is bad. That's the only thing you learned from this video? Mazel tov. Queen to d6. Out of the pin, defending the pawn. White goes back to h3 because white doesn't want to get the bishop taken. Now rook to a, rook a e8. Basically just taking a moment to get the only piece that has not moved yet to join the party. 
All right, get over there. Stop being a wallflower, right? Is that, is that what that's called? Wallflower? I don't know. It's like the person who doesn't dance at the party. This video is all over the place. Queen to d2. And now bishop to b4. Essentially, Frank Marshall is saying, okay, I'm going to pin the knight to the queen, and then I'm going to play d4. And you're going to have a problem, right? So that's why we get bishop takes f6, an immediate reaction by white. But the thing is, that pawn trade way back when solidified the center, and now we see the point. Now the rook is going to get involved. Now white plays rook to d1. Okay? Queen to c5. Increasing the pressure, you want to go d4. You say, why? well, you, Levy, you said he was going to go d4. Why didn't he do it? Because in chess, my favorite concept is danger levels. The queen is worth as much as a queen. So you can avoid a trade, or rather, you can avoid material loss by attacking something of equal value. So bishop takes will result in knight takes queen. You say, well, that's easy. I just move my queen. Then I, Yeah, but then white takes with check because the king is also worth more than the queen. And then I move the queen out of the way. So that is why he didn't rush. He plays queen c5. Stay patient, y'all. Some of y'all played chess like you're, you know, late for a business meeting. Queen to e2. Bishop takes c3. Pawn takes c3. Queen c3. And now white plays rook takes d5. Nice idea here. Utilizing this pin on the undefended rook on e8. It's one of the reasons you don't snap take. In fact, if he takes here, it's white to play and win in three moves. Check. Now black has only one move. And now the bishop comes in as the hero. You have to go to the corner and you get mated. How quickly a chess game can turn, right? I'm winning, I'm winning, I'm winning. And all of a sudden you want to throw your computer out the window. So rook takes d5 and Frank Marshall plays knight d4. Nice move, transferring the knight in. Remember, the queen has to stay pinning. So the queen moves to h5. Doesn't stay pinning, but, you know, it attacks the rook here. If the queen had gone here, this would have put some pressure on the knight. Uh, here there's a cool move for black. Rook f4. Guarding the knight by attacking the queen, and you can't take because I would fork you. So that's kind of a cool trick. But queen to h5 using the concept of danger levels, and black plays rook f8. So now, again, we see the benefit of fe6 because the doubled rook's on the f-file pressuring here. White plays rook to e5. Now here, Frank Marshall has a choice between two wins. Win number one is impressive. It's, you know, it's a normal win. It's a nice clean conversion of the position. Uh, but win number two gets gold coins showered on the board and gets a Gotham Chess YouTube video made about the game 109 years later. Because I believe this game was played in 1912. I will be extremely embarrassed that this game was not played in 1912. It was played in 1912. I just checked my other monitor. So... Clearly, Frank Marshall was thinking about making it into a chess YouTube channel 109 years uh, from then, in 1912, when he played this game. So, the routine win is the very natural rook takes f2. Why is that winning? Because you're threatening to take, and if they take you, you have a, bank, you have a back rank infiltration. Because this rook covers the f1 square. It's called x-ray, right? It's not this, because that hangs a queen, but it's this. And it doesn't matter who blocks, whether it's the queen or the rook or this rook, it's mate. But Frank Marshall, like I said, wanted to end up in a YouTube video and played the move rook to h6. That attacks the queen. You say, what's, what's so good about that? The queen just moves. Let's say it just goes to g5. Well, here Frank Marshall shows you the reason. Kabam. Now, Frank Marshall, trust me, if he had the option of crazy win, uh, uh, routine win number one and crazy win number two, he's going to go crazy win number two. Here's the point. You can't take because I fork everybody, f frankly. I mean, my horse just forks everybody. So, we got rook to c5, and Levitsky must have thought, okay, I'm going to attack the queen. Queen's going to move, maybe I can play rook c7, and this, and this. And if you'd like to pause here and find the move, although it was on the thumbnail, uh, please feel free to do so. I'm going to take a sip of my seltzer. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the coolest moves of all time, I present to you, queen to g3. I mean, what more to say? What more to say? Queen to g3, white resigns, mic drop, game over. Here's why. If h takes g3, you've now opened up my rook's vision to the h file, and knight to e2 is mate. If f takes g3, you've opened up my rook's vision to your rook, knight e2, king h1, and rook f1 is mate. Okay? Queen takes. Potentially the funniest one. Knight to e2, king to h1, knight takes, and there is a double pin situation. King to g1, knight to e2 check, king h1, and, you know, probably this. And we have an endgame where I have an extra knight. Which I trust that will, they will win. 
And then last but not least, if you don't take, like, I don't know, you play like here, for example, then I would play knight to e2, check. And by the way, you can't mate me. Queen h2 is not mate because I'm defending you from the other side. Knight to e2, or potentially the cooler one, knight to f3. When have we ever seen something like that? King to h1 and rook h2 is checkmate. Queen h2 is one move more because the rook and the knight would be integral to the attack. I mean, have you ever seen something like that? No, you haven't. That's why you're happy that you clicked on this video, and that is why 10 minutes later you are, uh, well, no, actually, I was going to say the same thing. Never mind. But, yeah. Now, that was 1912. Frank Marshall played against and defeated many, many strong players. And I told you that after I showed the gold coins game, Queen G3, by the way, there, there, there is one kind of funny thing about this. Uh, some, of the, some people say that it's because people wagered on this game, so they just threw the coins. I mean, I like to believe that a game was so boss that people literally just took coins out and, you know, nowadays we all got some, you know, cryptocurrency debit, what are people going to throw their debit cards on the board? People are going to throw their Amazon gift cards on the board? Like, relax. So, the la you know, the, the second thing that I wanted to show is, uh, is a game, not, not really a game as much as just the, the playing style of Frank Marshall. That last game was amazing, uh, and the move was amazing, but I just want to show you the contribution that Frank Marshall made to chess, which might amaze some of you. So, Frank Marshall, you know, allowed the Ru uh, the Ru I always say Ruy Lopez, but that's not how you say it, Ruy Lopez, he always allowed the Spanish... And one of the open main lines of the Spanish involves b5, bishop b3, and castles. And here, black plays d6, solidifying the center and then deciding, you know, are you going to play uh, knight to a5, for example? Are you going to play uh, what's known as like the Chigor and the, the Briar, although back then not a lot of them had names, right? The Zaitsev system with bishop to b7. But Frank Marshall invented theory in this position which is played to this day over a hundred years later it's been worked out to be good the best adaptation it had was boris spassky uh the later part of the 20th century he adapted it and that is the immediate move d5 now according to computers this is still playable for black and this is the idea takes takes and you sacrifice the pawn in the center of the board but white has no queenside development right and nowadays, people play c6, and what they do is they move the bishop to attack the king, they bring the queen out, sometimes they bring the bishop out, and it's pandemonium. And, like, with optimal alpha zero preparation, maybe white has, like, 0 0.2 advantage, but oftentimes, you know, the games end in draws. Uh, but, of course, the unprepared opponent, not the super grandmaster, will get absolutely destroyed in the martial positions. These positions are... A disaster for white if you're unprepared because you're going to deal with four very angry pieces maybe five very angry pieces further down the line now back in the day we got knight to f6 but this is kind of the point look we're talking about jose raul capablanca one of the greatest players of that generation arguably in history um and this is the year 1918 now historically frank marshall did not score very well against capablanca but nobody really did but it shows you look at this look what frank marshall does knight to g4 watch what he does you can't just, I mean, you can't just take, because then I go here, and I hunt you down with my bishops, right? So Capablanca shows discipline and plays queen f3, and Frank Marshall says, bro, I don't care if my rook is hanging, I'm gonna hit you with queen f2. So now we get d4, the only move to keep advantage. You say, why isn't he taking the knight? He doesn't need to. But Frank Marshall shoves that knight down his throat. Now, again, the only move. Rook e2. What? Why can't you just take? Well, then bishop g3. Frank Marshall is making, actually, I apologize, not bishop to g3. Bishop to g3 is wrong, because I just realized queen takes f7 is mate. <laughs> rook f7, rook e... <laughs> oh, that would have been bad. I would have gotten a comment. Oh, oh, Levy, you hung mate in two here. Probably bishop to h2 check, I would imagine, but then king f1? Oh, but then you can play this, because now this comes with a check. Oh, God. Okay, Frank Marshall, you're insane. I mean, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me, Frank Marshall? So that is why he plays knight f2, and that is why Capablanca doesn't take it. I'm learning as I go here, right? Then he, sac he sacrifices a bishop, right? Hg2, and he, and, he, and he hunts the king. He's down two pieces right now, and he's hunting the king. Look, he takes the rook, uh, and now this is hanging, so Capablanca has to once again find the only move, which is bishop to d2, right? We get bishop back to h4. Like, this is the playing style that this man brought to the game. 
And in this game, Capablanca took every bit of resistance not to succumb to this pressure. Look, he is throwing everything at this guy. He's just shredding the position open, destroying the safety of the king. And Capablanca just covers up like this, weathers the storm, and he ultimately wins the game. You say, what's so impressive about this? He just lost all his... Guys, bro, I mean... Come on, show some respect to Frank Marshall. I, this kind of creative play took like 10 only moves of resistance, and we're talking about Capablanca, who was the world champion. So this is the, what the man brought to the table. Frank Marshall has uh, long-lasting contributions to the game of chess in terms of the theory that he brought. Uh, there are many Marshall gambits. There is also uh, this Marshall gambit in the, uh, in the, in, in, in the, Queen's, uh, the Queen's gambit, d4, d5, c4, e6, and then here, when black plays the triangle defense, you can play e4. This is known as the Marshall Gambit because there are lines where, for example, after check, you lose the pawn on d4. And that this is very much a Frank Marshall kind of thing. And it's incredible that the stuff that they played in 1915, 1920, 1925 has been perfected to this day and is still played very frequently. That always blows my mind because those guys did not have the answers. The fact that they were able to pave the way, in, in Frank Marshall's case, in multiple variations and openings uh, for the openings that we see nowadays, especially in an opening like the uh, Rui Lopez, which is just so popular at the top level. Incredible. Just incredible to see. Uh, feel free to read a little bit more about Frank Marshall and his, you know, fa he brought a real New Yorker swagger to the chessboard. Now, obviously, the Marshall Chess Club is named after him in New York City. Uh, a club that I've played many, many tournaments at, all the way from, I don't know, I was about seven years old. I'm 25 now, so... Yeah, once again, hope you are enjoying these dives into chess history and taking a look at some games. As always, if there's a player or a game that I have not yet looked at, do let me know in the comments below or upvote some of the other top comments so I do see them, I do read them. I frequently take ideas and then ultimately make videos about them. As always, if you're new welcome to the channel i've got tons of playlists for you to check out and enjoy chess and learn i've got courses link is in the description and that's it i will see you in the next video